Imagine a tree that begins to lose its leaves as winter approaches, until one day the last leaf falls. Now, the leaf falling didn't just happen spontaneously, there were all sorts of causes, like the sap receding inside the tree and the wind and so on. Those causes actually necessitated the leaf falling, which is to say, given that they had happened, the leaf had to fall. And until those factors were in place, the leaf couldn't fall, because outside the weird and wonderful world of quantum foam, things don't happen without adequate cause. So until the conditions were right, the leaf couldn't fall, and at that moment when the conditions were right, the leaf had to fall, and not before. So surely, if we knew enough about the wind and the trees and all these different complex things, we'd be able to predict exactly when the leaf would fall. And presumably the same is true of the motions of the planets, and the tide, and the weather, and the tectonic activity of the Earth's crust, and oh my god, I think you can see where I'm going with this! It seems like events in the universe are necessitated by previous events. Given that these causes happen, the effects have to happen. But we are physical parts of the universe too. Our brains are presumably subject to the same causal laws as everything else. The astronomer and mathematician Pierre Laplace famously said that if we knew all the positions of the atoms in the universe and all the forces governing them, we would be able to predict exactly what would happen in the future. The rugby match, the lottery results, everything, including human activity. We normally think that we have choices and we could do other than what we do, but if we are just physical parts of the universe, then we are subject to the same laws as everything else. Our brains cause us to do actions, but only because our brains are configured in a particular way, and they're only that way because of a previous state, and they're only that way because of a previous state, and a previous state, and so on and so on and so on and so on, all the way back to the beginning! Which means that we don't have any free will, we can't do other than what we actually do. It might feel like you have a choice about whether to get out of bed and do some work, or let Netflix queue up the next episode of The Thick of It, but actually, you were always going to stay in bed. You don't have a choice. The laws of the universe necessitate that action, and they always have. You are in most in a maze. This is the philosophical position known as determinism, and before we start picking holes in it, we need to understand why it's important. You might remember that old aphorism of Kant's, ought implies can, if you morally ought to do something, it must be the case that you can do it. If determinism is true, then all of morality is pretty much out of the window, because it doesn't make sense to say to somebody, you should not have done that, if they literally could not have done otherwise. So we're talking all of morality here, the stakes for this discussion are pretty high. If I go to court and they're going to punish me for breaking a window, then if determinism is true, I could no more have avoided breaking that window than I could have avoided being born with brown hair. Now, they might still lock me up to stop me breaking more windows, but it doesn't make sense to morally condemn people if they can't do other than what they do. Okay, now some criticisms. The one that probably immediately leapt to mind was that modern science tells us that causality is a little fuzzier than people in Laplace's day might have thought it was. Apparently, deep down at the quantum level, things do happen which are uncaused. They happen randomly, so maybe that's some kind of escape from the iron fist of causality and determinism. But if something happens randomly, is that really what you'd call free? If all your actions were spontaneous, random, uncaused, is that what you mean when you think of free will? Another argument against determinism would be to say that there are more to humans than just what's physical. There's an immaterial mind or a soul which isn't made of matter and so it isn't really subject to the same cause or laws as everything else. This position is called dualism. It was espoused by our old friend René Descartes and it has a lot of problems which we don't have time to go into, but there is a link in the description to an episode we did on that very topic if you're interested. Kant was the one who originally pointed out that freedom is necessary for morality. He said that causality is a built-in way that we have to view the world, but that the world itself Self might not really be like that, which is enough to allow for the possibility of freedom. For more on Kant and how his ideas fit together, you can watch this really odd episode where we talk about it, in which the audio quality is not very good, and I have a rocking beard! But one of the most famous criticisms of determinism came from David Hume. Hume said that all this talk about free will and determinism seems very tough, but that's only because this whole time we've been defining free will incorrectly. 
For Hume, free will doesn't mean doing something that isn't caused in any way, it just means doing what you want to do. And we're fine with saying that what people want to do is generally predictable. For instance, if you have a mate over, then you can probably predict that they're going to want to hang out, maybe watch a movie, maybe have a couple of beers. You can predict that they won't want to do a naked handstand in the street and then nick all your stuff. We're fine with predicting what people want to do. Say you have a choice between salad and cake. Free will just means doing what you want to do. It's not free if you're forced to choose one by a lunch lady with a handgun, but if it's in accordance with your wants and no other agent forces you, then that's just what we mean when we say free will. Now what you want to do is still determined, and there's still a sense in which you couldn't have done otherwise because your wants are fixed by your upbringing and your societal role, etc, 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 but as we've already established, we are fine with saying that we can predict what people want to do. This view is called compatibilism, or soft determinism, because what you want to do is still determined, and you still can't really do other than what you actually do, it's just that the compatibilists don't think that's a problem. What do you guys think? Do we have free will? Does Hume's definition overcome the moral problem that Kant pointed out? What do we even mean when we say we have free will? Send me your questions, comments, queries and comebacks underneath the video on Facebook, Twitter or by email. Next time we could either stick on the topic of willing and wanting and do what is weakness of will, or we could do do we have individual duties to the environment. Subscribe to join the Floss fans and either leave a like or don't. The choice is yours. Maybe. Despite some people impersonating me in the comments of the last episode in a disappointingly mean way, there was some great discussion to be had, so let's see what the Floss fans had to say about was the universe designed? Abhijit Borkar pointed us towards some very interesting research concerning whether the fundamental constants of the universe are actually evolving over time. This would speak against the fine-tuning argument, because if the universe was fine-tuned for life, then why is it changing? Why not just have the perfect conditions for life straight off the bat? That's very interesting, thank you. Kafik Jelen said that the fine-tuning argument doesn't point to any specific deity, but we can infer some attributes of the deity and guess that there's something like the Judeo-Christian god. Are you gonna back that up at all, or...? Me, you, and a couple of other people allegedly quoting Darwin said, I do not see how the eye could have evolved. There are two important things to say in response to this. Firstly, if you actually read The Origin of Species, he says something like that and then goes on to say, but, and explains how the eye evolved, and he uses it to make a point about not making judgments just based on what seems weird, but actually going with the evidence. Secondly, even if Darwin did say that and mean it, even if he totally rejected evolution and had a deathbed conversion, as was falsely said by Elizabeth Cotton, that wouldn't matter to the truth of the theory, because being a scientific theory, evolution doesn't rely on anybody's authority for its truth. It's not true because Darwin or anybody else says it's true, it's true because it matches the facts. XY Zara left a very lengthy and multifaceted reply, and I'd like to take some time to dissect it precisely. First of all, XY Zara, you said that a superior being is necessary for morality. In actual fact, God could not be the source of morality. I refer you to our episode on the Euthyphro Dilemma. Moreover, if you want to advance that position, you're going to need to say, first of all, that there are moral facts, which a lot of philosophers would deny, and second of all, that those moral facts can't be natural facts about the world. For instance, facts about what is good for humans. If you are going to advance those two meta-ethical positions, then that's fine, but you will need some arguments for it. Secondly, you said that evolution doesn't explain why DNA contains information. Actually, biology does. Different organic molecules have different shapes, so they fit together in different combinations, and certain combinations work and certain combinations don't. When ribosomes synthesize proteins, they don't understand the code, it's just that certain combinations of molecules fit like a jigsaw and certain others don't. There isn't really information in it any more than there's information in one domino telling the next domino to fall over. It's just very complex cause and effect. If you google protein biosynthesis you can learn all about it. Thirdly, you said that certain things like brains and microorganisms couldn't have evolved because they're just too complex. I recommend the book Climbing Mount Improbable, which will explain to you exactly how these complex things arise in very, very gradual stages from very, very simple to very, very complex. Or again, just Google it. Fourthly, you said that it's unlikely that these complex things just arose randomly. That's a common misconception about evolution. Genetic mutation is random. Natural selection, the process by which organisms become adapted to their environment, is not random. It's actually quite well understood. It's causal. It's mechanical. Again, Google will tell you more.
Fifthly, you said that the brain is the most complex thing in the universe. Actually, the most complex thing in the known universe is my mum's wireless printer, which is so utterly recalcitrant that no one human can operate it successfully without lethal intracranial hemorrhaging. Oof, I swear this used to be a philosophy channel, but we care about the truth, so I hope you won't begrudge me that brief foray into biology. Anyway, Andrew Vandermeer said that the fact that we are the only intelligent beings in the universe shows that God created us specially and prioritises us and wants to be in a special relationship with us. The technical term for that relationship in Christian theology is communion, by the way. There are two things I need to say in response to this. Firstly, it's very unlikely that we are the most intelligent being in the universe considering it's so big. If you Google Drake's equation, then that's a little bit controversial, but it might at least be a good place to start learning about what scientists think about the probability of extraterrestrial intelligence. Secondly, I have the same question for you I had for my theology professor. If God created us because it wanted to be in communion with us, then why didn't it just create us in that relationship already? Why the circuitous route of coming to know it and love it and obey it? Why not just boom and there we go? And if your answer to that is, oh well actually it did, there was Adam and Eve and they were perfect and then there was the fall, then I'm afraid I can't accept that answer because history tells us that didn't really happen. And if your answer to that is what my professor's answer to it was, which was just, well, I don't really know, God works in mysterious ways, then is that the best explanation, or is the best explanation that we weren't divinely created? These are just my opinions, I'm not trying to force them on anybody, but stuff to think about there. Whew, that is a lot to take in and to think about, and that really is all the time we have this week. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye!